Hello and welcome to another video trying to get you the very top grades. Possibly you're a student who's been saying to themselves, why on earth do I need to know about adjectives, adverbs and verbs? Like, why would I want to know that stuff? This is a video which incidentally will teach you all of that, but it will teach you much more. It comes from a request from a viewer, Hrishikesh Bandari, who has posted a short story for us. He is a pretty good writer and I'm going to show him and you how to become a much, much better writer. On the way, we're going to see two images from Picasso, how weird is that? And then we'll get into the actual story and how to make it awesome. So here we go. Hrishikesh Bandari says, Hello, Mr. Salles. Here's a story I attempted after trying out some techniques from some of your videos. Now that's really important because often what you find is as you start to improve, you overdo the techniques. And that's where uh, Hrishikesh is, and that's what I'm going to show you, how once you've mastered the techniques, how to use them effectively. And so here's his problem. I often get comments that my stories are too descriptive. Well, they will be because they're full of the techniques, you see. And so the next trick is when to use those techniques and how often. Could you please edit it and give it some feedback? Yes, I'm going to do that. And uh, for those of you doing the IGCSE, he's given us what the task is. Write a story that involves a place underground. But of course, this is exactly the sort of task you could get whatever your exam board. Okay, so the technique I'm going to teach you is less is more. So no doubt you've heard of Picasso. He's probably the most famous artist of the 20th century. And this is his painting of a dove made in 1949. That is exactly what a dove looks like. Well done, Picasso. But look what happens in 1961. Now he's changed his mind. A dove looks like this. Now, this is the analogy that I want you to have. When you're learning all the techniques, what you do is make a really good representation of the dove. Your piece of writing has all the skills in it. However, that's a really tedious picture. You know, you'd look at that and say, Picasso, are you joking? I'm not interested. This one is much more simple and much more immediate, and it has more information in it. This dove is flying. I could describe that as almost a smiley, happy face. It's definitely not a sad one. And it is offering something. So suddenly, even though this is much more simple, it conveys a lot more information. And that's what I mean by when less is more. You get much more information from less. Let me show you in writing. This is the first paragraph. The long, drafty, subterranean passage wound endlessly, its murky atmosphere sending shivers down my painfully arched spine. Badly corroded walls closed on me as I grazed past them. I attempted to keep my advance surreptitious. Something told me that these heavy feet were not the first to trudge through the passage. Now that's a really good bit of writing, and it has plenty of description in it, and I've highlighted in yellow the adjectives. But the downfall of this writing is that it tells us too much. It's too complete a picture of the dove. And here, the dove isn't our story. Yeah? We want to get on with the story. So my version is below, and it tries to include the details here, but just the ones that matter. The passage seemed to wind underground, long and narrow. Its walls closed in on me grazing shoulders and elbows. So here I get the sense that the narrator is uncomfortable. He feels or she feels. I'm going to make it a he because I I adapted this and so I'll just, you know, I don't want to be sexist. So he is feeling trapped and attacked by the environment just as he was there. Okay, I have lost something here. I've lost the idea that he wants to approach surreptitiously in silence, in secret, but I can introduce that easily in the next paragraph. I don't need the detail that the walls are badly corroded. I mean, I don't need to know that, do I? I just need to know that they're hostile, they're grazing me, and that single word tells me that it's hostile. I don't really need to know that it's a murky atmosphere um, because... I can, I can work that out 
by the fact that we're underground. You know, the reader can just, just, no one thinks it's sunny and pleasant underground. We already infer that information. Again, less is more. Okay, the next paragraph also has some pretty good description in it. Coarsely cut, with sharp, jutting pieces of rock, the stairs were a menace, often stubbing my toe. Gradually they disappeared under the veil of blackness that engulfed me. Apprehensively, I switched on my torch, its dim light flickering, inching forward. But in my version, I try to get rid of all this description, which just slows the action down. So here we go. Stumbling against the coarsely cut stone and irregular stairs nearly made me cry out. I risked torchlight, dimming it with my hand. So the first thing I want to teach you is that in this paragraph, the narrator only does one thing. That's the single verb that tells us what the narrator is doing. That slows action. However, if I give my narrator lots of verbs, lots of actions, suddenly the speed at which things are happening is much greater and there is a greater sense of drama and pace. But I'm also going to help the reader with the less is more idea. Having a verb lets the reader infer things about the narrator who's the subject of these verbs. So if the narrator is stumbling, we realize that they are uncomfortable and possibly scared. If the narrator is crying out, we definitely know they're in pain and possibly scared. If the narrator is risking, now we know that that fear is real, but they're trying to overcome it because the dangers are more real than the fear. Okay, so now you get the idea that there's a lot more going on simply by using many verbs. Okay, sometimes the double adjective is really useful. And I like the, word, the way that we've got alliteration here with the coarsely cut, and I've kept it. Uh, because it's not just the fact that it's alliteration, but the sound of it is harsh, coarsely cut stone. And that harshness reflects the harshness of the environment, which is making the narrator cry out. I need to describe the stairs as irregular because that gives the idea that they're uncomfortable and possibly he's tripping up on them because he can't predict where they are. And we know he's in darkness. And that does the whole job of the stairs were a menace often stubbing my toe. I get that straight away from the word irregular and knowing that we're in darkness in this passage. So hopefully you're getting the idea that I don't just mean write less when I say less is more. I mean give exactly the right details that allow the reader to picture exactly what is going on. Remember, this dove had too many details and it was boring. This has just the right number of details for us to infer meaning. The next paragraph I've been brutal with. Here you can see my paragraph down here. Let's see what we've got. Frigid and heavy, the ancient air seemed too overwhelming for my modern self. Fear infiltrated my very being, its sly moves punctuated by the heavy beats of my heart. Salty beads of perspiration lined my forehead, dropping onto the charred floor. I felt my feeble impetus being strangled by the blaring silence, a subtle beast hampering my meagre progress. Well, again, you can see that we've got the double adjective at work here, but we've got adjectives all over the shop. And again, it slows the pace down. It's just there to say, look, Mr. Examiner or Mrs. Examiner or Miss Examiner, I am explaining through description. But that really slows everything down. So I keep one double adjective and it's the one that gives me most information. This is the one that shows he is being overwhelmed because it's heavy. Uh, it's the one that links to his fear because it's cold. And it's going to give us this contrast because he's going to be sweating despite the cold. So this then, this contrast, gives me the magnitude, the size and force of his fear that he's sweating even when it's really cold underground. Now the next thing I want to show you is the use of verbs. Uh, Krishikesh here has got some brilliant verbs, infiltrated, punctuated, strangled, hampering, really powerful verbs which give us a real sense of the action. However, 
These are all verbs given to the environment and not to the narrator, and that makes them less powerful. Whereas, my choice of verbs gives us a real picture of the narrator. So, if the narrator is forcing himself on, we know that must mean that he's afraid. We don't need to spell that out all the way up here with his heavy beats of his heart. You know, we know that his heartbeat must be raised. Why? Because he's forcing himself and also he's sweating. Again, less is more because these telling details help us work out exactly what's going on to the narrator, physically and mentally. And again, the power of the verb does that for us. Okay. Abruptly, the cave ceiling rose to unknown heights, revealing a cavernous hall, a courtroom of death personified. Lining its pitch-black walls were dwarf candles with lanky yellow flames that danced in the chilly air. This is a lovely Gothic description, but again, it has almost too much in it. Look at the adjectives again, and that uh, adverb which slows the action down. Well, I've decided to keep the um, adverb that slows the action down because there is a change of pace here. He's come from one situation in these cramped, narrow passageway into a much different one, into the halls. So this is a complete change of focus. So I will allow the adverb. But the ceiling rose to unknown heights, revealing a cavernous hall. Uh, I'm still choosing his words. I don't need to know that it's a courtroom because he's not really being judged here. And I don't need to give the idea of death because we've already got that hinted at through the word black. I loved the idea of dwarf candles, um, but I think he just meant small candles. Uh, and also it's contradicted by the flames being lanky and long. And this didn't really make sense to me, small candles with really long flames. But... I use that idea by having the flames flickering, as we know, but instead of calling them flickering flames, I'm saying the walls are flickering and the flames dancing, and that's the idea that I've just taken from Krishikesh's writing. Okay, you'll also notice that I don't have really powerful verbs here for the narrator, and the reason for that is I've got this change of focus because the environment has suddenly changed, and I want the reader to notice it. However, I don't want the reader to notice it for four lines, to really slow my action down terminally. I just want to have a brief pause. I use two lines only. I love Hrishikesh's next paragraph, a single word paragraph, candles, and it's exactly the right word, because there shouldn't be candles here in this environment. Um, it's anachronistic, in other words, it's uh, something from a different time, it could have had electricity, and also there's a worry here, if it's all lit with candles, people are waiting, the reader infers. And this is the perfect example of less is more. We're inferring all of that from a single word. Now, the fact that he's presented it as a single word paragraph also says to the reader, hey, pay attention, this is a really important detail. Again, that's less is more at work. Okay, this is the final paragraph I'm going to show you. Candles for centuries. Impossible. My heart froze. I was too scared to breathe. The thought of intruders lurking was unbearable. Tightly gripping my obsolete single-shot pistol, my only weapon along with a skinny baton, I peered cautiously. My petrified heart told me to flee, but my inquisitive mind told me to stay and witness the future happenings unfold. I chose the latter. After all, I couldn't allow a bunch of stubs of candles to ruin my years of research. So the crucial bit here is that he moves on despite his fear, and also this backstory that there's been years of research. I need to include that detail. But again, you can see from the yellow that there are adjectives everywhere slowing the action down and two adverbs which also really slow the action down. So what have I done? Impossible. Years of research and someone had beaten me to it. Or worse, I was expected. My single shot pistol and steel baton sat on my hip and I felt for them now, knowing they would not be enough. So even though this is much shorter, I've managed to add in this extra bit of detail, knowing they would not be enough, 
which ramps up the sense of danger and gets the reader to think, well, this is a first-person narrative, so I obviously know the narrator survives in the end, but what new difficulty awaits him? Okay, I've also kept the double adjective of single-shot pistol because that's really useful. It shows us that he's prepared, but actually not very. He's only going to have the one shot. I've changed the skinny baton, which would make it useless, to a steel baton to make it more plausible that he'll be able to defend himself a little bit. Um, although, to be fair, I could have just left that at skinny. That was just a personal choice. I've included the extra detail now that they sat on my hip. Now, I'm hoping this is a less is more moment because this conveys how ready he is to use it. It also shows that he's somewhat prepared, even though he's only got one shot. He at least knows how to use these weapons. And this will be plausible later on, I hope, when he comes up against a greater force, perhaps more than one person. Um, it will be plausible that he can defend himself a little bit, or perhaps make some sort of escape. And I don't know which way Hrishikesh's story is going to go, but I'm preparing um, that, and I do have a strong sense that he will escape, because it's a first-person narrative, and I therefore know he can't get killed. I've also managed to include less is more in my backstory. So I've kept the idea of years of research, which was brilliant, but now... I've got the idea that this person who's down there, or people, are rivals who have beaten him to it in some way. This is a kind of Indiana Jones moment, you know, when he goes into the pyramid or wherever he is and discovers that perhaps someone has beaten him to the archaeological treasure. Uh, but then this allows me to give another possibility, that his quarry, the person he's hunting, uh, knows that he's there and therefore he is now becoming the hunted. Having these two possibilities is really useful because the reader's mind is now activated. You know, we have two possible sources of danger. One, a danger to life and safety, and the other one, a danger to the professional standing of this person. You know, all this research wasted. So this was Hrishikesh's original 265 words, and now this is what we're left with, 110 words, which I hope includes more detail in it that's useful to the reader, even though it's less than half the length. Let's hear it in its entirety so you get that feeling of what is included and how that's better than what's been left out. The passage seemed to wind underground, long and narrow. Its walls closed in on me, grazing shoulders and elbows. Stumbling against the coarsely cut stone and irregular stairs nearly made me cry out. I risked torchlight dimming it with my hand. I forced myself on, still sweating despite the cold, heavy air. Abruptly, the ceiling rose to unknown heights, revealing a cavernous hall, its black walls flickering with dancing flames. Candles. Impossible. Years of research, and someone had beaten me to it. Or worse, I was expected. My single-shot pistol and steel baton sat on my hip, and I felt for them now, knowing they would not be enough. So hopefully you get a sense of the new pace that we have here because of the lack of adjectives, the lack of adverbs, and these powerful verbs one after another. Now, I haven't introduced any new ideas. I've taken exactly the ideas that Rishikesh gave me. In other words, Rishikesh could do this for himself, as could you. And this is a great way to practice improving your writing. And I hope along the way, you've learned that there really is a point to understanding the purpose of adjectives, adverbs, and verbs. Well, thank you very much for watching. Remember, my perfect metaphor of less is more, it's Picasso afterwards, 1961, compared to Picasso before 1949. Peace out. I say that because this is Picasso's Dove of Peace. And as usual, if you would like me to uh, make a video on your work, please post it in the comments below. And uh, good luck with your writing, with your revision. Do not forget to subscribe.